Well, we want to talk now about uh, Paul in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was one of the key New Testament churches founded by Paul. After leaving Corinth on his second Mediterranean speaking tour, he spent nearly three years in Ephesus where he won considerable converts among the pagan Gentiles. The Ephesian church was also strengthened by the presence of Priscilla and Aquila, Jewish Christians who had been expelled from Rome, and also by the preaching of Apollos, who was an itinerant uh, preacher, Jewish Christian preacher, from Alexandria in Egypt. It was the first of the seven churches of Asia to which John later wrote his revelation, in which he commends them for their uh, toil and patient endurance, as well as for their discernment and intolerance of evildoers, though he does rebuke them for abandoning their first love, Revelation 2, 2 to 4. Along with Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, Ephesus was one of the greatest cities of the Roman Empire. Caesar Augustus made it the capital of the province of Asia, the richest region of the Roman Empire. The Greek geographer Strabo describes Ephesus as the greatest commercial center in Western Asia. In Greek mythology, Ephesus was founded by the Amazons which uh, was a fierce race of female warriors. The word Amazon derives from the Greek word amaza, which literally means breastless or without a breast. The English word mastectomy comes from the same root word. The Amazons were so called because they removed their right breast so that it wouldn't interfere with their spear-throwing ability. The Amazons um, were warrior uh, females, and the warrior that was said to be responsible for founding Ephesus was named Smyrna. So I think it's very interesting that the residents of Smyrna, Georgia, near to where we live, (laughs) right, Uh, I wonder if they have any idea of what their town is named after. Anyway, to return to historical matters, Ephesus came under Greek control when Alexander the Great conquered it in 334 BC. After his death, Alexander's empire fractured into four parts depicted here, which were at war with one another. One part the Seleucid kingdom, centered in Persia and indicated here in yellow, um, first took the city. Afterward, it was captured by another part, the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt, uh, indicated here in the purple color. It was finally controlled by a remnant of a third part, uh, the local kingdom of Pergamon, up until 133 BC. In that year, the king of Pergamon voluntarily bequeathed the city to Rome. The city of Ephesus benefited from the stability which the Pax Romana, uh, remember that 200 year period of tranquility inaugurated by Augustus Caesar, brought to this region. During the New Testament times, the city had a population of some 250,000 people. Beginning in 1895, Ephesus has been the site of ongoing archaeological investigations carried out by the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Vienna. The ruins in Ephesus, as we shall see, are simply fabulous. Among the remains from Paul's day are the theater which seats uh, some 24,000 people and has such amazing acoustics that everyone sitting 
in the theater can hear without amplification the voice of the players on the stage. And this theater features very prominently in the account of Paul's time in Athens in the Acts of the Apostles. The Prytanian or town hall, which serves uh, not only a political but also religious purpose in Paul's day, persists. The Agora or the marketplace, the commercial center of the city, uh, the baths and the gymnasium, a medical school have also been excavated. All of these buildings that we'll see the remains of would have been familiar to Paul. The city stadium was constructed slightly later during the Emperor Nero's reign and the stunning library of Celsus uh, pictured here only came into existence during the second century. What does not remain from Paul's time, unfortunately, is any vestige of the Temple of Artemis. It was, by all ancient accounts, an amazing structure. Ancient writers include it as one of the seven wonders of the world, along with the Egyptian pyramids, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, the sculpted tomb of Mausolus, and the statue of Zeus at Olympia. The Greek poet Antipater wrote in 140 BC, I have gazed on the walls of the impregnable Babylon, along which chariots may race, and on the Zeus by the banks of the Alpheus. I have seen the hanging gardens and the Colossus of Helios, the great man-made mountains of the lofty pyramids and the gigantic tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the sacred house of Artemis that towers to the clouds, the others were placed in the shade, for the sun himself has never looked upon its equal outside Olympus. The original temple was destroyed and rebuilt in 550 BC. This structure was the largest building in the Greek world at the time. This temple was again destroyed and a third temple, even larger than the second, was built in the first half of the third century BC. According to ancient descriptions, like that of Pliny the Elder, this temple was adorned with paintings, gilded columns of gold and silver, and statues by renowned Greek sculptors, including statues of Amazons. It measured 450 feet long and 225 feet wide. It featured 100 and 27 columns around the temple, some rising to a height of 60 feet. Now, to furnish a point of comparison for you, the fabulous Parthenon in Athens measured only 228 feet long by 101 feet wide and featured 69 columns with a height of 34 feet. So, when we visit the Parthenon in um, Athens, recall that the gigantic temple of Artemis in Ephesus was nearly twice the size of the Parthenon. Just astonishing, it staggers the imagination. By the way, there is an outdoor miniature park in Istanbul uh, featuring this scale model of the temple of Artemis along with uh, scale models of many other ancient structures in case anybody would like to go see it during the free morning that we have on our second day in Istanbul. After the temple of Artemis was destroyed, some of its columns were incorporated into the church Hagia Sophia, uh, which we are also going to see in Istanbul. Paul first came to Ephesus on his second speaking tour of Mediterranean cities, just after visiting Athens and Corinth. 
uh, unfortunately, due to the route of our voyage, we seem to be tracing Paul's journey in reverse. We are going first to Rome, then Ephesus, and finally Athens, when in fact, chronologically, the order was exactly the opposite. Paul was first in Athens, uh, then in Ephesus, and finally in Rome. So we're tracing his journey in reverse. And as we'll see when I talk about Paul in Athens, Paul first passed through Athens in A.D. 50. He then spent about 18 months in Corinth. Then in A.D. 52, he sailed across the Aegean Sea, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila to Ephesus, on his way back to Jerusalem, and ultimately uh, his home base of Antioch. Luke records when they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Even though Paul was apparently merely passing through Ephesus, we see his evangelistic heart in his taking the time and effort to visit the local synagogue and share the gospel, just as he had done while tarrying in Athens. No archaeological remains of the synagogue in Ephesus are extant. But Josephus says in his Antiquities of the Jews that there was a Jewish community in Ephesus since Seleucid times. Recently, an inscription has been found at Ephesus which mentions the officials of the local synagogue. Sometime around A.D. 52, Paul did come back to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, traveling overland and visiting other churches in Asia. Arriving in Ephesus, Paul entered the synagogue as he promised uh, and debated with them. But as Luke records in the Acts of the Apostles, his welcome there was short-lived. He writes, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, arguing and pleading about the kingdom of God. But when were, some were stubborn and disbelieved, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Apollos, who is mentioned here, was a, an itinerant Jewish Christian preacher from Alexandria, Egypt, who had earlier passed through Ephesus and was discipled there by Priscilla and Aquila, whom Paul had left in the city. By the time Paul arrives in Ephesus again, Apollos had gone on to Corinth where he watered the seed that Paul had sown there. Writing later to the Corinthians, Paul was to say, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 6 met with a mixed reception in the Ephesian synagogue. He obviously won some Jewish converts because Luke says that he took his disciples with him when he left the synagogue. But others spoke evil of the way, which was the name of the Christian movement looking to Jesus as Messiah before it was called Christianity. After three months, Paul withdrew from the synagogue and began to reach out to the pagan Gentiles. He reserved space in the lecture hall of Tyrannus and for two years gave daily lectures there. 
The so-called Western text of ancient manuscripts contains the interesting note that Paul argued daily from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., that is, from the 5th to the 10th hours. In his textual commentary on the New Greek New Testament, the great textual scholar Bruce Metzger says that this note probably represents an insertion into the original text. But he adds, and I quote, it may represent an accurate piece of information preserved in oral tradition before being incorporated into the text of certain manuscripts, end quote. Although the remains of this hall have not been positively identified, an inscription bearing the word Tyrannus has been found and may well mark the foundations where the hall once stood. Now notice that Paul is not simply preaching here. The verb dialegomai indicates that he is arguing for Christian truth claims and discussing them with anyone who cared to come. Here we see Paul, the public lecturer and debater in a secular context. He serves as an inspirational model for my personal ministry of university speaking and debating. Paul invested a good deal of time in establishing the church in Ephesus. Luke mentions two years of lecturing, and in his final address to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 31, Paul says that he spent three years total with them. We might hope to gain some further insight from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but the best manuscripts do not identify this letter as written specifically to the Ephesians. Uh, the letter contains no personal greetings or notices at all, leading most scholars to infer that this is actually a general epistle to be circulated among the churches in Asia, including the church in Ephesus, and hence it lacks any local color. What happens next in Ephesus is pretty wild. Luke tells us, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now Macedonia is the Roman province in northern Greece, where Thessalonica is, and Achaia is the province in southern Greece, where Athens and Corinth lie. We know from Paul's correspondence with the Corinthians that he was really putting the screws to them to give what they had promised for the collection for the church in Jerusalem, just as the churches up in Macedonia had done. So, Paul is here expressing his intention to revisit these churches, collect the money, and take it back to Jerusalem as an expression of the solidarity of the Gentile churches with the Jewish mother church in Jerusalem. And once that mission has been completed, Paul wants to go to Rome, as we saw in our earlier talk about Rome. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul says that a wide door for effective service has opened to me in Ephesus, adding ominously, and there are many adversaries, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9. These adversaries now become explosive. Luke writes, about that time there arose no little stir concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together and with workmen of like occupation said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. 
And you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable company of people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of our great goddess, Artemis, may count for nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Now, I've already mentioned the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The Greek historian Pausanias writes in his description of Greece, all cities worship Artemis of Ephesus, and individuals hold her in honor above all the gods. The reason, in my view, is the renown of the Amazons, who traditionally dedicated the image. Also, the extreme antiquity of this sanctuary. Three other points, as well, have contributed to her renown. The size of the temple, surpassing all buildings among men. The eminence of the city of the Ephesians, and the renown of the goddess who dwells there. Artemis is the Greek goddess who is known in the Roman pantheon as Diana. In Greek mythology, Artemis is the daughter of Zeus and the twin sister of Apollo. She is the virgin goddess of hunting and is often depicted with bow and arrow. Uh, her worship was widespread throughout the Greek world. But the so-called Artemis of the Ephesians appears to have been something special. In, Ar in uh, Ephesus, it appears that the classical Artemis may have become amalgamated with an archaic Ephesian mother goddess of fertility. The syncretistic Artemis of the Ephesians is often depicted with bulbs around her torso, which some have thought to be multiple breasts. Um, but excavations at the temple in 1987 to 88 suggest that they are more likely a necklace of sorts. In Ephesus, there were two major festivals held every spring honoring Artemis of the Ephesians. Theatrical performances and games were held in her honor. Pliny the Elder describes the procession in which the goddess's image was carried through the streets of Ephesus, surrounded by young virgins and attracting large crowds. And I think you can see from this how deeply invested the Ephesians were in their local deity. And I hope that all of the groups going through the Vatican were able to see the statues there of Diana on the one side of the hallway and opposite Diana, the Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, I had not anticipated that we'd, we would actually see original statues of these goddesses uh, in the Vatican. I was delighted that uh, we had the chance to actually see what I'm talking about. In excavations of the Pritaneon, or the town hall, two huge statues of Artemis have also been found there. The silversmith, Demetrius, is a craftsman who produces miniatures of the statues of Artemis of the Ephesians. His speech is a sort of backhanded compliment to the success of Paul's church planting in Ephesus. He stirs the populace into a religious frenzy. When you see images uh, on television of out of control crowds in Cairo, for example, chanting, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, God is great. I think you can get a picture of what the riot in Ephesus must have been like with these crowds shouting over and over again, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Luke then continues, so the city was filled with confusion and they rushed together into the theater. 
dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. Paul wished to go in among the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Some of the Asiarchs also, who were friends of his, sent to him and begged him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews put forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand, wishing to make a defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all with one voice cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The theater mentioned here is an open air half amphitheater which seats around 24,000 people. Gaius and Aristarchus were representatives of the churches in Macedonia, who later accompanied Paul to Jerusalem with the Macedonian gift for the saints in Jerusalem. Alexander was apparently a representative of the Jewish synagogue who wished to disassociate the Jews from the troublemaking Paul. The Asiarchs, mentioned by Luke, were wealthy aristocrats who administered the League of Cities in Asia. Their presence here uh, shows Paul's influence throughout this entire Roman province. Now, in a few days, or is it tomorrow, we'll actually have the opportunity to, yeah, in a few days we'll be there, not, we've got Istanbul first. Then we'll, we'll have the opportunity to sit in this very theater and imagine what it was like for Alexander standing down on the stage to try to address this insane crowd. And as you're sitting there, imagine Paul asking to address this crowd himself and so to defend the gospel. What incredible courage this man exhibited. Well, before Paul and his comrades can be torn limb from limb by the mob, the town clerk manages to quiet the crowd. Luke writes, and when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be contradicted, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls, let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, for we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, there being no cause we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and having exhorted them, took leave of them and departed for Macedonia. And so Paul and his colleagues escaped with their lives. Here we see once more the Roman legal system portrayed as fair to the Christian movement. The town clerk would have been a sort of secretary of the city council, and he commends the courts, and the Roman proconsuls as the appropriate route for filing complaints. But he himself testifies that Paul and his cohorts are innocent of any offense. There are statements in Paul's Corinthian correspondence that could be references to this incident in Ephesus. In 1 Corinthians 15.32, Reflecting on the hope of the resurrection, Paul says, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus? <laughs> In later Roman times, gladiatorial combat would actually take place on the stage of the theater in Ephesus. And this is the image that Paul evokes here. 
in 2 Corinthians 1, 18, uh, 8 to 10, Paul reflects on his experience in Asia. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He rescued us from so deadly a peril, and he will continue to rescue us. On him, we have set our hope that he will rescue us again. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, since he says in chapter 16 and verse 8 that he intends to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. Taking these passages that I've quoted to refer to this incident in Ephesus might involve too late of a date for 1 Corinthians, but Luke's time notices are notoriously inexact, and it may be that Paul did not leave Ephesus immediately after the riot. Or it may be that the riot was simply the culmination of previous events to which Paul refers in his letter. Paul's final contact with the Ephesian church was his meeting with the Ephesian elders in the city of Miletus on his return journey to Jerusalem with the collection for the believers there. And I think it's fitting that we close with some of the parting words of this faithful servant of God. He said, you yourselves know how I lived among you all the time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which befell me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance to God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, bound in the Spirit, not knowing what shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may accomplish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God.